I find myself unable to sleep now that I've reached the end. I feel unclean. I feel like I've been manipulated into oblivion. I often love to revisit books after reading them, but I never, ever want to touch this book again. It's like a cursed object. I need to pass it on like a dark and dirty secret. To put it more succinctly, I am in awe. I am in awe all over again of the power the books hold, that they can do this to us, tease out emotions in us and make us believe things that aren't real, all with the power of our imaginations, teased to life by beautiful prose and searing characters. This book reminded me of why I love books, why I love to read them and write them. I hate this book. I love this book. Read it now. I felt this polarity, this sense of tectonic shift whenever I read Gone Girl, because I'd never read a story like it. That's Allison Dixon, the author, cultural critic, and host of the Ding Dong Darkness Time podcast. I'm Jason Blair, and this is a Silver Linings Handbook podcast bonus episode. Last month, I joined Allison on the Ding Dong Darkness Time podcast to discuss the cultural phenomena of both the book and the movie Gone Girl. The idea for the episode came from a comment that Allison made to me before coming on the Silver Linings Handbook podcast last October. In that episode, we discussed the fascination of all of us as people in darkness. And one of the things that Allison had mentioned to me before the episode was that her own writing, including two of her books, The Other Miss Miller and Strings, were in part inspired by Gillian Flynn, the author of Gone Girl. After we recorded our Silver Linings Handbook episode, I went to look for the episode on Gone Girl on Allison's podcast. It was nowhere to be found. So I suggested that we do one together. We were both taken aback by the response to the episode online and in our inboxes, and as well during a movie night where we watch Gone Girl with some of the Silver Linings Handbook podcast Patreons. Listeners talked about how the mind-boggling tale of Nick and Amy Dunn was just an exaggeration of what can happen in relationships as facades begin to drop. Others talked about the ends that people will go to when they fear abandonment. Other listeners discuss gender roles captured in the book and the movie, that it was not the woman this time discovering the plot twist, but she was actually the one who was driving it. Others said there were great lessons about things like the dangers of not being authentic. For those of you who have already listened to the episode, you can stop here because it's the same. But for those of you who haven't, I recommend you give it a whirl. Well, hello, my delightful denizens of darkness. It's the first episode of 2024 for me after taking a long break over the holidays. I guess you could say that I too was gone, but not like the girl we're about to talk about in this episode. That's right. We are talking about Gone Girl, the stunning 2012 novel by Gillian Flynn that defined an entire literary genre while brazenly defying convention with its depiction of a marriage most foul. It also inspired legions of aspiring authors to write books depicting the dark underbelly of domestic tranquility and the female existence. 
I happen to be one of those authors, actually, and I'll talk a little more about that throughout this episode. But I'm not exaggerating when I say that Gone Girl is the book that quite literally changed the landscape of my adult life. And the funny thing, it wasn't even my idea to do this episode. That comes down to the guest I have with me today. You've heard him here a couple times already, and you'll be hearing from him a lot more if I have anything to say about it. He's the host of the amazing Silver Linings Handbook podcast, where you'll hear all sorts of inspirational conversations with people from every walk of life. He's also a damn good friend. So welcome back to the show, Jason Blair. So Allison, I have been talking about you all day. So <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> I, I, right, so I was telling a friend that I was coming on the podcast and she was talking about how we do an amazing job together. And I was saying, well, I'm pretty sure Allison will do an amazing job. I'm not so sure about me. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> <laughs> you are going to do great. And this was your idea. I think you even said, yeah, we need true. to talk about Gone girl and i was like wait a second i think you had mentioned it yeah i don't even know what yeah, what really inspired it was you know when you came onto my podcast and i love that episode in last october Same. you came onto my podcast and i was researching you and i think we talked about it in the episode but that jillian mm -hmm. really uh was an inspiration for you and i was thinking you know Oh, you must have done an episode on it. So I went through your whole catalog and I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> no. no, and I, I did all of Stephen King. Well, not all of them. I mean, who could? I would still be talking about him if, if I were. But yeah, the whole idea that I could have just done an episode on her and this book in particular, but I'm happy to talk about all of her books. Um, sadly, she only has three, but um. Yeah, it just blew me away. It just occurred to me. It's almost like the most obvious choice that never occurred to me. And so <laughs> I but I want to ask you, because you came up with this idea recently for us to talk about this. Did you have a recent experience with the story or have you read it before? Or what was your experience with Gone Girl? Well, yeah, so it's interesting. I didn't start with a book like a lot of even though I'm a writer and avid reader, I actually started with a movie. I had heard about the movie. um, over and over again. And my part, uh, my former partner's ex-husband was like, dude, you got to see this. It's like your kind of movie. And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah whatever. <laughs> and um, then eventually I did see it and I was like, holy cow, this really is like a psychological thriller with a twist. And I was very intrigued by that. But I think what really started to capture me, then I read the book afterwards, is I thought this is a metaphor for a lot of different things. So much. And, you know, each time I expose myself to the book and I expose myself to the movie, I see more and more in deeper and deeper metaphors. Now, I don't know what Jillian intended, but I'm going to take the license that we say about art. It's whatever the reader or viewer sees in it. So yes, <laughs> I have a, uh, I have my perspective on it that I would, I would love to ch share. And the movie, by the way, is just brilliant. It came out in 2014, um, directed by David Fincher, starring Ben Affleck as uh, Nick and Rosamund Pike as Amy Dunn, which is stunning casting. I think um, when they announced the casting for it, I was like, oh, yes, I can absolutely see it. Rosamund Pike is a lovely British actress, and she hadn't done a lot at least over here, of this type of character. She she tends to play, honestly, so, sort of more ordinary type characters in a lot of the work that she's done, but not that kind of icy, blonde, almost Hitchcockian type of character. She killed it. I just loved her in this movie. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, you know, if I had read the novel first, I would have been like, okay, so, you know it'll be really hard to play Amy's character, just given that you're really actually playing multiple characters in it. And, uh, uh, you know, the facade that she puts on as a part of the um, framing her husband is one character. And then, you know, certainly the next part of it is a completely different character. And there are few I think actors or actresses who have that level of versatility, if that makes oh, sense. Oh, yeah. To be able to really, with 
just probably the uh, your eyes alone uh, show a complete change in mood and personality. She really has that. And by the same token, I almost feel that Gillian was imagining Ben Affleck as she was writing this book. I can't imagine another actor, honestly, playing Nick, Nick Dunn. <laughs> he, he is that sort of too handsome for his own good kind of face that I think is only... I don't know about actors, but I have a couple neighbors who are yeah, pretty much like... <laughs> you know, they, they just look like they're not real. Sort of like a John Hamm is another actor that's kind of like this. He's almost too handsome. It's almost like a like handsome... And I don't mean handsome in a way that I... And physically attracted to him. I just mean in that like classic, yeah. you know, traditional classic American. In that lantern handsome. jaw, like you know, you could just see him in like a fedora and a trench coat, you know, in the in some detective movie or something. Just that classic, yeah, classic handsome. But also, there's something about Ben Affleck in particular where he just looks like a guy who is very repressed in some ways. He's always kind of had mm-hmm. like this, he has that facade and then you could tell there's like something boiling inside him, but it's under about like a 50 foot slab of marble. And, you know, so getting that heat to the surface, it just doesn't always quite make it there. And that's what Nick done kind of is. There's another thing that got me thinking about it. So in December I had an episode, because I occasionally do these like off the beaten track. You know how most of my episodes are uh, interviews, but I had this um, episode where or these episodes where I occasionally have people come on and talk about psychology and one of my colleagues we were talking about like the idea of uh, having a low level of skepticism, right? Mm -hmm. Like And, you know, the personality traits that relate to naivety. And, you know, I asked all my guests to come up with examples, and my colleague, Brittany Lawhorn, came up with the example of Nick. And him sitting there, you know, smiling in front of his wife's picture at the press conference and smiling with other people because that's what he thought people were supposed to do. And even his truly believing that you could walk into your own house Your kitchen would be clean. Everything would be clean. There would just be a broken table and a turned over chair. Like if I saw that instantly, I would be like, yeah, um, somebody set this up. Yeah, But he's just so naive. And I'm pretty naive myself, Mm -hmm. but he's exceptionally naive. And uh, that is like... It's a hard role to play, I think. Just to give a rough outline here, and by the way, we're going to talk a lot, uh, and we already have, we're going to talk a lot about the plot. There's going to be spoilers. We're going to act like everybody who's listening to this has seen it or read it or doesn't care um, if they get spoiled. So just fair warning. But the story is set in uh, Carthage, largely set in Carthage, Missouri. And that's actually where Flynn herself comes from. Um, now, I don't know if she's specific. No, she's from Kansas City, but she's from Missouri. She's a Missouri gal. And her previous books are also set there. So this is like her main. She just understands that Missouri Appalachian, or I'm sorry, not Appalachian, Ozark kind of, you know, way of life. And and she also understands sort of the class of, you know, the sort of Midwest worker class um, way of life, the rural uh, way of life in that part of the country. So she comes to the fore with that in her back pocket. And she was also a uh, reporter for Entertainment Weekly for quite a while as well. So she worked in entertainment journalism. She has, you know... She knows the New York scene, yes. which plays a role. In and, the... and I think, you know, what? who better almost than a journalist, but also an, an entertainment journalist to really understand facades. You know, yes. I mean, when the people that they're covering yes. largely are actors, celebrities, things like that. And I think she had took that insight and really uh, turned it on a domestic, gave it a domestic spin yes. and, and put it in a marriage. That idea that we put on personas, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like, I think about it for myself. I was thinking about it most recently, the last time I read the book, and I was thinking, wow, I do have personas. Like, for some friends, I'm like the fix-it man. For some friends, I'm the guy who dismisses logic. I mean, dismisses feelings and goes for logic. Yeah. For other friends, I'm like the comforter and the healer. 
But I, I would say the one difference for me where I think it can become extreme in relationships is that all of my friends know a little, know most of me, right? Mm -hmm. They actually, they, they know all of me. It's just the role I play in their lives as opposed to a persona that I put up that is a wall between me and them. Right, right. Yeah. And that's very much, you know, I, I tend to be very compartmentalized and, you know, and similarly, you know, I have friends that know me in a certain way, you know, uh, as a certain mm -hmm. type of personality. And there are people that have seen me at my absolute worst. There are people who have seen me only at my best. Um, and so this story plays a lot with that because uh, think about, you know, when you're in a new relationship with somebody, uh, let's say just for the sake of this story, we'll say romantic relationship. And in the sense that you you have your sort of like initial meeting and you're trying to impress each other and you're trying to be the best version of yourself that you can cobble together. You know, that's usually what we like to think we're doing. But eventually, once you're with someone for a while, those facades kind of start to slip away because you start to feel comfortable with one another. And there's always that joke of like, at some point, you're going to become comfortable enough to pass gas around each other. Yes, yes. Well, and one of the things that I find, like certainly in dealing with my friends and their relationships and my own, is that, you know, I think about my longest running partner, we knew each other when we were 14. There was no persona to put on, right? Like right. She, she could see right through me and I could see right through her. So, but I think of, you know, a lot of my friends or even other relationships, the whole sort of like piece of mating mm -hmm. that involves physical attraction first. And then what you do is you essentially, not everyone, but you create a persona to fulfill what you want from that physical attraction, right? right? Where, you know, for me, it goes the other way around, where I really sort of like build a deep bond, emotional bond with people. And until that point, I can't even be physically attracted. So I feel like an anthropologist sometimes in <laughs> examining um, regular relationships. But I think there's that risk to putting on that persona or becoming too intimate before the persona falls. Yes. Oh, that's a very good point. Um, yeah, for me, it, it tends to be a bit of a balance, like those early days of like, I, I'm very self-conscious, you know, by default. And so I always try to just be aware. And I relate to Nick a lot in this book, like certain aspects of him. And I want to say, I don't know if it's the Midwest nice things. I, I grew up in this part of the country, not Missouri, Ohio, but um, close enough, we'll just say. I could convince you to smile at that press oh, conference. I, I have a horrible habit of that. <laughs> I always have, a, you know, I've gotten a little better at kind of having the resting bitch face, as they call it. But for the most part, I would always be in that people pleaser mode of trying to mm -hmm. get ahead of a conflict by being ready to just drape peace over everything you know i'm always trying to just out well, outrun this is, the negativity yeah this is good because i can totally relate to to amy in the sense that um you know i think for much of my life i've tried to hold back parts of myself and you know i can't relate to her and we'll get into it with her relationship with her parents because my parents were lovely yeah. but holding back a piece of myself or kind of like shaping myself slightly to other people and then i think what happens with amy and i know i'm getting ahead of myself here is that you know she builds this relationship with nick they have the facades up she finally gets to the point where she can trust him and she drops the facade mm -hmm. and then he cheats on her because he doesn't like what's behind the facade. Yeah, and what's behind that facade is really something else. And and what makes this story so explosive and, and why I think in all, uh, many ways this, this book sold 20 million copies is because of the revelations that it makes not only about, you know, its characters in general. And not, you know, she's not the first one who ever did a plot twist, for God's sake, but... I don't think we tended to see many that feature women um, or a woman featured in a way that Amy is in this book. And and honestly, she did this uh, and Flynn did this in her previous two books as well. But this uh, concept of the quote unquote unlikable female character 
I love what Flynn said. She said this in a, I think a 2019 interview of how she had been finding a lot of books that she didn't want to read because they all featured women that were packaged in these pretty little boxes and they weren't allowed to be unsavory. They weren't allowed to be presented in a way that was like negative. Even whenever we talked about or would talk about like female killers and female criminals and things like that, it would have to be packaged in just such a way that wouldn't allow for the actual feminine violence to come out. Well, and that's an interesting thing about female villains, I think, or I guess that stereotype of the manipulative woman or the bad woman, Mm -hmm. it tends to be somebody who's single, if you think about it, right? Nurse Ratchet in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Mm -hmm. Nest. Um, I when Angelo D- Angelina Jolie plays um what is it Maleficent yes. the character in that uh, Glenn Close and Fatal Attraction mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right like we tend to believe in our heads that men are generally smart enough um like even that crazy character Grace Jones plays in um is it the, what do you call is it, it the Bond uh, movie or yes in the oh, Bond yeah, yeah, movie yeah, yeah. Uh, was it, yeah. Uh, View to a View Kill, to a kill. Or, yeah <laughs> yeah yeah like they're all single they're all evil they're all whatever and even if they were with a man it was briefly until he realized very quickly that she was crazy yes and so <laughs> yeah and uh, I, I really think, like, part of that may come from the idea that I think men don't like to think about the fact that they can make either poor decisions or their behaviors at the beginning of relationships can really sort of, like, serve as seeds to this disease that's right. going to exist. And I think... You know, we tend to want to characterize women villains as there's something so fundamentally wrong with them that they can't function in society in a normal way. I'm kind of jumping ahead here because I will say the Amy that we are presented with in the beginning of the book, she's presented in a series of diary entries because but the book begins essentially with uh, her disappearance. The only way we see Amy is through her diary entries. And we see Nick, her husband, in real time uh, as the story is unfolding. And he discovers her disappearance and it kind of rolls downhill into this big missing persons case. He's, of course, the bad guy. And of course, elevating all of this is the fact that Amy was kind of a minor celebrity in her own way because her parents were mm-hmm. famous authors who wrote a series of books, childhood books called the Amazing Amy books. And it was based on their daughter or some idealized version of their daughter. Um, sort of like the, they sound almost like the Ramona Quimby books or the anything like Beverly Cleary. It was like, it sounded like, like a dorkier version of those, honestly, the way they were described in this story. Mm-hmm. Um, Amazing Amy just sounds like a giant doofus. Um, but <laughs> yeah, so that book, yeah, they they write this book, Amazing Amy, mm-hmm. same name as their daughter. Yep. And it's very interesting. So, like, there's this one point where they're at a party for related to, like, the complete collection of the book. Mm-hmm. And um, Amy... If someone asked Amy, did you get a dog? And that was referring to the book. And she said, no, she got the dog. Right. And she's talking about Amazing Amy. And then the actual party is to celebrate the character Amazing Amy's wedding. And, uh, you know, so like her parents were almost messaging to her uh, where where she was for them, which was less than their character, or where they wanted her to be. Yeah. And I thought, for me, it's kind of interesting, and I have a lot of sympathy for Amy, because I think from the beginning, she was never allowed to be who she was. That you inherently have to either uh, conform completely to who other people want, either manipulate or do what I would say are passive-aggressive behaviors or passive behaviors where you mask who you really are and get used to it. Mm -hmm. So I do think the seeds of Amy's challenges really come from her parents in childhood where, you know, the real Amy was viewed as unacceptable. So why, if you're Amy, would you present to Nick anything other than a persona? The parts of the book that talk about her experiences growing up uh, as, you know, amazing Amy, quote unquote, 
there was one part where they she talked about how she wanted to quit playing violin, that she was not into it anymore. She was never really into it. And so she decided to quit. So in the next book, in the next Amazing Amy story that her parents wrote, Amy was presented also with the choice to give up violin, only she decided, no, she was going to press forward or they, she discovered she was actually a prodigy and she didn't want to like uh, give up. So she just becomes this great violin player. And it's like, imagine the passive aggressive backhand, like the strength of that for a child whose parents are writing this shit. How do you not internalize this deep sense of really abandonment and loneliness sort of that forms the cornerstone of a lot of personality disorders uh that sense of and uh, that you're either you're not acceptable right you're not acceptable if that's a trauma mm-hmm. right that's her original trauma right right or or close to that so then later in the story when nick kind of rejects the real amy when she drops the persona it makes sense mm-hmm. that she would go A little nuts, right? Yeah. And I think that happens to all of us when we haven't felt accepted. Now, we don't frame usually our partner for murder and kill some other guy, right? We are ex. We don't normally do that, but we can get a little excitable and a little volatile and a little hot when something like that's done again. So I, sorry for interrupting you. No, no, you're fine. I, the book details instances of, when Amy was young and she was already starting that manipulation game and and it would all happen when it seemed like the people that she had put on a pedestal had even begun to let her down in some way mm-hmm. and l- not be the perfection that she envisioned. The substitute parents, the substitute parents for her, I felt. Yeah. In the book. Oh, absolutely. And her her parents, uh, to add to that um, clusterfuck of of things going on for her as she ate as she gets older into adulthood she's in her mid-30s by the time she you know we're in this story i think she's 36 uh at the um uh, time of that and they'd been married for five years so she was in you know early 30s when she got married but she had to grow up seeing her parents be this idealized couple like they are so in love with each other it's this quote-unquote perfect marriage and for all intents and purposes yeah they there's no hint that there's really a whole lot of ugliness in this marriage. They truly love each other. And so she has to live with that because she has grown up by this point, not understanding love at all, not understanding liking anybody or anything at all. She doesn't know who she, she just doesn't, has never allowed herself to let go and enjoy life. And she finally did that with Nick. And then when she finally let herself enjoy it and let that guard down, Yeah, he rejected her because what he saw was that she was a miserable, untrustworthy person that he could never live up to pleasing. And so what does he do? He goes and has an affair. affair. Yeah. But do you think, and this is a question I have, do you think that that is almost something, and I'm not saying it's just women that this happens to, that society, parents have certain expectations for women about what they're supposed to behave like, what they're supposed to be interested in, what boys will like or men will like. And the expectation is that you conform to it. And I see a lot of women not really breaking out of that until their late 30s and 40s. And You know, I find, and, you know, maybe your parents, you're lucky enough to have parents who uh, don't sort of ascribe to that. But even then, your school, your teachers, the message has got to be, and I would love to hear your perspective on this, like, oh, you shouldn't be you. Mm. You should be this version you should be Barbie. You should be. Oh, you should be whoever. I mean, right? All the time. I think a uh, tone policing has been has defined so much of my life as a yeah as a woman. That idea. I mean, I I don't think I ever intensely related to another woman as much as I did when I watched uh, Hillary Clinton run for president. And I'm not trying to get political here. I'm just saying mm-hmm. that watching a woman be the front runner candidate for uh, um, the Democratic or any political party running for president in the United States to watch a woman be constantly 
threading that needle of acceptable human behavior. On the one hand, you're robotic and you don't exude any sort of maternal anything and I can't relate to you and you're too cerebral. And on the other hand, if you show any emotion whatsoever, uh, then you're hysterical and you cannot be trusted with the nuclear codes, but we're going to vote for this crazy motherfucker anyway. anyway. You you end up being... Yeah, viewed as shrill yeah. or angry. And I think there's another piece of that, like that it also shapes the ideal of men. So when they find somebody who doesn't fit that ideal, it begins to like shatter this societal expectation. I think that is a great um, segue to uh, one of the things that made this book famous apart from its plot twist was the cool girl monologue is what it's referred mm. to. And anybody who's seen the Barbie movie has seen a take on this uh, with America Ferrara's wonderful uh, monologue about being a woman in modern society. But Miss Flynn got there first. Uh, and I'm just going to read a little excerpt because I absolutely love and it goes on a bit longer than this. But this is this is the the meat of it here. Being the cool girl means I am a hot brilliant, funny woman who adores football, poker, dirty jokes, and burping, who plays video games, drinks cheap beer, loves threesomes and anal sex, and jams hot dogs and hamburgers into her mouth like she's hosting the world's biggest culinary gangbang while somehow maintaining a size two. Because cool girls are above all hot, hot and understanding. Cool girls never get angry. They only smile in a chagrined, loving manner and let their men do whatever they want. Go ahead, shit on me, I don't mind. I'm the cool girl. When you are trying to perfect for someone you're trying to impress as a woman, you don't want to be the nag. Mm -hmm. you, you don't want to be the the albatross around his neck you don't want to do all these other things that'll make him think that you're just not cool uh so the what the first time i read the I book and i encountered that i fully understood my entire dating life i understood my entire interaction with the male species up until that point had been about learning to or trying to be cool and that um, that rung with me. Yeah, absolutely. Let me throw out the other side of it, right? Like, I think, you know, one of the promises that Nick makes to her when mm -hmm. he first courts her as they're walking down the stairs at the wherever was, he says, you know, like, no bullshit. Our relationship is no bullshit. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people say those things in the beginning and it encourages people to be more open. But, you know, like I, even when I first saw the movie and I didn't know what this was about, I was like, this man is full of shit. Oh, because for sure. ultimately, ultimately, you know, if you have to say that, <laughs> I, I sort of feel like your authentic authenticity isn't there. And what Nick did not do is give her real feedback on how it felt. He freaked out. He uh, misbehaved. He had an affair that looked strikingly like the beginning of his relationship with Amy. Yes. With the cool girl mm -hmm. who, you know, uh, in the middle of him being a suspect, sneaks it, or sort of sneaks into his house and, uh, you know, has sex with him in the chair as his twin sister is sitting in the other room. Right. He's l literally, like, dating his student. Yeah. Cheating with his student, who is like a mirror of the cool girl that Amy originally was. Right. And, yeah. Uh, well, that is also something his his twin sister, Margo, she's... She's so great. I really love her. And she's really like the sensible uh, half of that twin brain that they that they have. The only, yeah. The only sane character other than Nick's lawyer, I yeah. think, in the entire and maybe the detective in this. If entire anything, book. she's kind of the audience surrogate character because you're really kind of every, every time Margot speaks, you're just like, yes, OK. Uh, she, yeah, I agree <laughs> with that one. And she had said to him when she found out about his affair, which, again, 
beautiful plot structuring in this book because we don't know that Nick is having an affair until way later into the story. We're following along with Nick as his wife has gone missing on their five year anniversary and he's, you know, trying to make sense of everything. And th- there's already a search underway and interview, police interviews, and the whole media spectacle is just beginning. And it's almost like dropped right at the end of the first act where he's like, okay, yeah, I should mention I'm having an affair uh, because his, he'd had this phone that had kept ringing throughout the first part of the story and he's just like uh okay and we don't know what the hell's going on there but then all of a sudden andy the girlfriend walks in yeah and in the movie uh amy goes missing and that day he's calling and calling and calling and us as the uh viewers believe he's got to be trying to call amy's phone but no it's andy the girl yeah. he's having a, an affair with. Yeah. And she... Nick is really hard for me to like. Uh, he is... Well, <laughs> first of all, um, the book version of Nick, you asked me earlier uh, before we got on here if there were a lot of differences between the book and the movie. And I, it, in terms of the story itself, no, not really. In terms of the plot and the characters, no, not really. But the book really highlights the fact that Nick is a hella misogynist. He is, he doesn't like women very much. Uh, He'll even say like women are crazy. And, you know, you like words like stupid bitch because his his father, giant misogynist, like king of misogynists. And his father is wasting away from Alzheimer's in a home. And there's, that's a whole little kind of like subplot or B story there. And so you get the sense that you know, he was a mama's boy. He was very close with his mother. He was very coddled by her. And then he has this hateful father. But at the same time, bits of his father come out in him. And you see that a lot, even without his direct dialogue, you see that misogyny is deep in him. And that makes him very hard to like. I agree. I, I think one of the things, and, you know, just sort of walking through the story you know, we get to the point where, you know, it's very clear they're having problems in their marriage. One of the scenes that I like is, you know, we find out later that Amy, through her trust fund, had paid for everything. The house was in her name. The bar that Nick and his sister, uh, um, Margot, uh, ran was in her name. And she had wiped out Mm -hmm. her trust fund doing it. And as the story sort of progresses and we start to find out, you know, all of these things about their relationship. And it's really hard to tell what's what, because one part is from Nick's point of view, and he's obviously demonstrated an ability to lie and hide secrets. Mm -hmm. Um, And another one is from Amy's point of view. And I don't know how credible to take that because she's setting him up for murder. Right. That first, uh, all those diary entries are like mostly bullshit, but it's interesting to kind of try to pick through and see where the truths lie. Um, One of the fascinations of the book. I, yeah, for sure. But you're right, though. There is that dueling unreliable narrator aspect. Although it's funny, I read an interesting essay recently where they were talking about the use of the term unreliable narrator when referring to Amy. It's almost like unreliable in the sense that in the first part of the story, you don't know that the diary entries are a part of a setup that she is leaving that diary to be discovered. But there is also this aspect that when women reveal themselves to be terrible people, um, either in life or in stories, it's almost like she's not in control of these things that she's doing. She's not trustworthy. Instead of she's telling Mm. you exactly who she is. This is not an unreliable narrator. This is a very reliable narrator. It's just a narration you don't like. Yes, exactly. And that's, that's the part that I think is very true about it. That once you know it's manipulation and you go back into your head, she is Mm -hmm. a very reliable uh, narrator of the story she wants to tell. Yeah. And it almost, in a weird way, doesn't matter um, how reliable she is, but I think there's an element of sending the message in that about how she felt. Like, we don't know whether Nick really pushed her into the stairs yeah. and hurt her. We don't really know if he did some of the things that he did, but I certainly do believe that's the way she... Mm-hmm. Uh, Uh, felt. And some people have said that, you know, Gone Girl is a metaphor for some of the problems in the concept of marriage, like this idea 
uh, I think that many things are an illusion in marriage and that ultimately marriage requires victimhood. Yeah. And it's such an American thing, mm-hmm. right? That somehow in America, compromise is considered victimhood, which is about the silliest thing I've ever heard in my life. Right. But it's it's this notion of victimhood being required in marriage. But I actually think the metaphor for me is much different. I think it's the cost of not being authentic. Yes. Yes. Don't be authentic. And I've seen this a thousand times with my clients, coaching clients who have mental health challenges. I've seen this a thousand times in the relationships of my friends. The ones who are not authentic pay a huge price. And I was telling a friend today, like I was saying in the beginning, or maybe you and I were talking about this too, but In the beginning of a relationship, and it doesn't even mean a dating relationship, it could be somebody new at work, and people laugh at this. I I will have my first meeting with them after they come, and I will list all the horrible things about me. Like, And I'll be like, this is going to happen when I'm really annoyed, and this is going to be happen when I feel like I'm really an introvert, and this is going to happen. Now, don't get me wrong. I will apologize for it, but you may go and you may cry. Right? Yeah. Like, so I, I get all that stuff out there at the front, and I think what in life really helped me realize that is when I was at the New York Times and when I was a journalist, I think, and it doesn't just apply to the Times, there's a certain persona you take on as a journalist, and I think it, like, leaks into every aspect of your life. And I felt, like, post-Times, post-my fabrication and plagiarism, um, you know, resettling my life, I didn't know who the heck I was. Right. Right. Yeah. The personas had taken over me. Yes. I think that is, oh, you know, something that I think a lot of us find ourselves in too when we are getting older and we kind of are shedding our old skins like from the our from our 20s which i think we kind of have the most scars on them in a lot of ways uh through those years and then you know we come to new enlightenments and we sort of our personalities deepen in some ways and parts of us shed that aren't that were there i sometimes think about the person i was 10 years ago and when i when i read this book um more or less and Seeing it through the eyes of a 44-year-old. I got one for you, though. You know? I got one for you, though. I got one mm. for you. Are you talking about the person you were? Or are you talking about the reputation you tried to build? The person that you tried to make other people perceive? Oh, that's it. Right there. Yeah. I cared yeah. way more, way more about that uh, when I was younger. And I still do i mean i had this like kind of intense need to be liked and well not to be liked to not be disliked let's just say that people can feel neutrally about me and i don't care but i don't want people to not like me or to hate me and you know i would try to read these books like the subtle subtle art of not giving a fuck and you know some of these other you know stories that try to help me not be so fixated on what other people think about me um and some of it has gotten through but it's it's a work in progress. So I have a colleague at work who says this about me, and I have several friends who say this about me, that they're so jealous because I have the gift of not giving a shit. Yeah. <laughs> like, I just don't. Like, yeah. And the beauty of, like, there are many horrible things about going through a scandal, but one of the beautiful things about getting, going to scandal is you realize you cannot control your reputation, so you just might as well be you. Oh, yeah. And I think over time, what I've learned is, like, and I think some of this comes from the process of learning to love yourself Mm -hmm. that that Amy was deprived of, and probably Nick was deprived of to some extent, that when you learn to love yourself, you stop giving as much care to how other people feel about you. You're able to say, hey, that person feels this way about me. That's their experience and that's okay. Or this person feels that way about me and they're an idiot. So why do I care? 
So what happens when that's your spouse? Oh, God. <laughs> you know, the interesting thing is like, I, I never see my spouse struggle with a lot of the stuff that these two struggle with. It's kind of crazy. I don't know if I need to. He's a unicorn. Yeah. And we should cage him <laughs> and copy him. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know. Uh, he, he has a gift. I'll, I will say that. But like the, the irony of all this for me is that when I first read this story and I uh, was blown away by it. We should tell these poor people what happened. Okay. So <laughs> I don't think we fully told them. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm going to start uh with the review that I wrote on Goodreads back in 2012 when I finished this book. My friend Jody on Facebook, she uh she's such a great person. She sent me the paperback because she was so blown away by it and the book had just come out. She's like, You need to read this. Mm. You were just gonna lose your mind. And this was uh, yeah, July of 2012. And at that point, I had just finished work on my book Strings. It was like a horror crime thriller set in the in the uh, sort of present day um, New York. And uh, it was the first story like that I'd ever written because I normally would write horror and science fiction or fantasy in other worlds, sort of paranormal and whatnot. But I I struggled a lot because I realized I always wanted to answer these big existential questions about the human condition and and all this. And I thought that sci-fi and horror were great places to do that from. But A, um, I sucked as a horror writer because I was not scary <laughs> enough. Um, and B, I sucked as a sci-fi and fantasy writer because I hate world building. Like, I like the world we currently live in. Just let that be there. That's not the part I'm concerned with. I'm concerned about the inhabitants. Um, so I don't care about the tech or the, you know, whatever. It's cool. I love sci-fi. It's just that I can't create it in a compelling way. So I was struggling with where to go. So I wrote Strings. But Gone Girl solidified for me what I wanted to be. And so uh, here's my review, though, on Goodreads. I said, how do I even begin to describe this mind fuck? I find myself unable to sleep now that I've reached the end. I feel unclean. I feel like I've been manipulated into oblivion. I often love to revisit books after reading them, but I never, ever want to touch this book again. It's like a cursed object. I need to pass it on like a dark and dirty secret. To put it more succinctly, I am in awe. I am in awe all over again of the power the books hold, that they can do this to us, tease out emotions in us and make us believe things that aren't real, all with the power of our imaginations, teased to life by beautiful prose and searing characters. This book reminded me of why I love books, why I love to read them and write them. I hate this book. I love this book. Read it now. I felt this polarity, this sense of tectonic shift whenever I read Gone Girl, because I'd never read a story like it. And now, admittedly, my my life was steeped heavily in Stephen King and Anne Rice and, and uh, Robert Heinlein and stuff like that. And then I read this and the sense of like this marriage. And it's just this story about these two people like colliding in this really fucked up way. And I knew I was like, I can tell stories like this. This book mm -hmm. gave me permission that I for some reason didn't think I already had, which is something that is dumb about me. I'm, I'm, I've always been that way. It's an exaggerated a version of what happens in relationships every day, right? right. Boy meets girl, mm -hmm. girl meets boy. They fake who they are. They finally get to know each other. Someone doesn't accept the other one or they both don't accept each other for who they are. They don't really know each other. Yeah. Uh, and people will fight. I think it's a great example, an exaggerated one, of what people will do to fight to get the person that they originally fell for. But the hook here is, I think, in addition to not being authentic, the other piece of it is, I think people don't care to get to know yeah. who the real person is. Oh, yeah. And so it goes both ways. But. Oh, for sure. And... You know, I, being able to see it play out the way that it did and this this whole idea that I could write an Amy character. Um, I had already written a sadistic female character in string. So I was already like really loving that. But to see not only someone else do it, but also this is a bestseller. This is a mega huge book. And I was like, 
okay, I can reach people with characters like this. Oh my God. So I I sat down in early 2014 to write what ultimately became this sort of, um, it was a very personal story about sort of ugly family secrets and murder that was in this uh, mm. sort of Southern Gothic setting um, that is, uh, that I'm very familiar with just from my own family and and whatnot. And, and when it was finished in June of that year, I submitted it to some agents around New York and chief among them was Stephanie Rostin, um, who was Gillian's agent. And cause I knew I was like the person who ushered gone girl into the world will understand what I'm trying to do with this book. And maybe just maybe it was like taking a shot at the moon. I mean, it was just like, yeah, this right. is never going to happen. It's just might a, as well roll the dice. You know, it, it's not going to hurt I'm like you. this, this agent who is a partner in her agency and in, in the top of in the Chelsea district and, you know, and in, in all this in the middle of New York. And I'm just like this nobody in Ohio who wrote this book uh, in her pajamas, right? Put their pants on one leg yeah. at a time. my friend. And, you know, I sent it out to a few other agents <laughs> and they all like liked it, you know, or I wanted to read more of it. But Stephanie was the one who wanted to get me on the phone. And, mm. you know, and I said, okay. I mean, just in that sense of like, I can't believe this is happening right now. I can't believe this is happening right now. And it was, it was, um, I couldn't even think. I couldn't even walk. It was just <laughs> like, I can't do anything. And then by um July of it only took about three to four weeks from the time I submitted the manuscript around town. I Mm -hmm. I was signing the contract with Stephanie uh, at LGR. Wow. And so at that point, I was like, oh, fuck, there's a there, this is happening. Well, you know, it didn't happen. The, well, the book that I I managed to get her with didn't get published. It came very close. But um, but the next book did. And um, and so ultimately, I, I like to think that, yeah, I dedicated the other Mrs. Miller to my husband. And I that was a heartfelt dedication. Mm -hmm. But it's really a secret note to Flynn to say, hey, this book Thank would you. not be here. <laughs> Without you. Yeah. You know, it's, it's very interesting. So, you know, as I think that it ties back, right? Amy and Nick are both, you know, writers themselves, yes. like frustrated writers. And that's kind of an interesting, and I forget which one, one of them works for an entertainment uh, weekly or publication. They work for another. And I think that, that. Yeah, uh, she wrote she does, personality quizzes for women's magazines. Yes, right. Yeah. She did. How appropriate, right. by the way. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. So I I mean it kind of makes sense, right? Like she has the gift of manipulation. She sets him up um completely for the murder. But the killer for me, right, is when she comes back, right, covered in the blood of her ex that she killed. Yes. And, you know, I thought, this is interesting. Yeah. But she wants him back. And that's an interesting thing. But she wants a version of him back that she can control. He's trapped. He can't split from her or there'll be a problem. And it's, you know, it's an interesting element to it where I think she's trying to do the same thing he's trying to do by the affair. Mm -hmm. She's trying to force the loving husband back and that is what we do in relationships we generally don't kill people to do it but right you know, like that and and she says that line i killed for you mm -hmm. and what i think that means was i killed for you to become mm -hmm. the person i want you to be and to stay with me and the other thing that strikes me about it is that first line right the first line where nick says it's the first line of the movie. You know, it's when I think of my wife, I always think of the back of her mm -hmm. head. Yes. I picture cracking her lovely skull, unspooling her brain, and trying to get answers, right? The, and he says, I think something like the primal question of marriage. What are you thinking? How are you feeling? What have you done to each other? You know, something. What would you do? And I thought to myself when I saw it the second time, well... To the answer to the question of what's going on in a lovely skull, Nick, you may have wanted to try to ask. Yes. Yes. Or create an environment where she could be her. Well, he is sort of that ultimate representation of the 
toxic masculinity meets the 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 guy who is resistant to change. Absolutely. He's fight club. He, and what is the first rule of fight club? Don't talk about it. You don't talk about anything. Uh-huh. And that's <laughs> yep. and mm-hmm. that's it. I mean, his so much of his um life he has tried to like uh, in the book they talk about the smile like his problem with his face that, that he's too good looking flynn does a really good job of wanting to um describe a guy that we all know like that really good looking guy you just want to kind of punch a little bit he's just got one of those faces because he's just like what a douchebag even though we so cute yeah but yeah yeah and it's like it, you hate to think that about someone but it's like there's that co- there's that comedian that's really popular right now um only because he's really attractive what is his name uh, matt rife i think his name he's mm-hmm. just this really he looks like a supermodel he looks like zoolander or something but he's he's a stand-up comic and he's become super popular because he likes to pick on the audience members and he just kind of seems like i don't i have not seen any of his stand-up yet but i just look at him and i'm thinking no <laughs> So, mm-hmm. And that's mean, yeah. but there is just like, I, I think of now when I was re- rereading this, I'm like, oh, yeah, he's totally a Matt Rife. I love how she described him because it's almost like, and Amy's the same way. She's gorgeous. She's hot as hell. You know, she's like, they. that's what they always talk about is like how good looking they are. So they have those external facades. They look mm-hmm. like a wedding topper, you know, wedding cake topper. They, yes, absolutely. But they don't know each other's personalities. And there's this line where... Amy says, Nick loved a girl who doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And she says, essentially, that she was pretending and and that that is the way she had done it often, pretending to have a personality. And she said that she couldn't help it because it's what she had always done. And and she's got this line in there where it's like, the way some women change fashion regularly, I change personality. Yes. And... I think, to some extent, we're a lot more like Amy often than we think. Mm -hmm. But Amy, in her particular situation, I don't think she survives and is loved by her parents and loved by other people without doing it. And I think Nick, if he doesn't play this role for his parents, like because there's definitely a lesson about parents and for parents in this entire book, then he doesn't really uh, survive because, or or emotionally survive. And then, and Amy says, and going back to that quote, Amy says like that she thinks most people do this. They just don't admit it or else they settle on one persona because they're too lazy or stupid to pull the switch. Yeah. And I, I just, <laughs> I just thought to myself, okay, Amy, like you need to sit down with a therapist. Oh, big time. you are probably right about most people have personas that they put on both times, but like for her to think this is adaptive, right, is uh, quite frightening. And and really, she reminds me a lot of you know when they when you talk about the traditional psychopath, um, in the sense of a good friend of mine who's a prison psychologist, he would tell stories about, you know, the the psychopathic people he worked with that would watch soap operas so they could learn how to emote. Um, They would mimic what they would see on the screen. Mm -hmm. And so you see that a lot in that in psychopathy, this this they, they don't have the ability to form those emotions the same way. And so they're mystified by a lot of it. And so they are just trying to mimic it or mask it and put it on. And Amy, very that just sounded to me like the psychopathic version of what we try to do. Like we we do put on different masks every day and we all have our different sides and facets that we show to each other, but they're all orbiting around a solid core of, Mm -hmm. you know, this is who I am. And people like Amy sort of have a void there and they're just trying to fill it with something to feel something. And, and I can't imagine what that feels like, you know, really um, I have times in my life have felt like disengaged from people. um, But the empathy has always been there. So I just can't imagine what it must be like for her. You know, do you know what people who are not psychopaths, uh, and everybody has a different response to trauma. Some people seek trauma. Some people 
they call it traumatic repetitive syndrome, recreate trauma, mm-hmm. an assortment of other things. Uh, some people run from it. There are all sorts of different options. But some people stop feeling. Yeah. And I can definitely relate to this aspect of it. There was a time in my life where I felt nothing. And I think it was because of, you know, all the trauma I saw as a reporter, things that I went through my in my own life, like childhood sexual abuse and other things along those lines. And then it developed into something very interesting. But during that time, people would have said to you that I was charming, empathetic, all those things, because I remembered those emotions and I knew that I needed to adapt. Yeah. To do it. And so that part I relate to. And then over time, I progress not to feeling emotions. And I had a therapist who really convinced me to like cross the line because I was like, this is pretty cool. <laughs> um, and <laughs> like, I see all these people like having these dramatic feelings and I'm like, mm. um, <laughs> but, but I also realized I was losing out on the joy in life by doing it. But I progress to inability to turn them off. Mm-hmm. Like, it was like a bloody light switch. I could go from, like, totally feeling to boom. Right. Feeling negative emotion, positive emotion. I could turn it off. And it was so tempting to let go of that, like, light switch. And it was really, really helpful. But what I think happens in that is that when you do not feel emotion for whatever reason, uh you have to get ahead and get along in the world. We're ultimately relational people. We would have all been eaten by hyenas, lions, and, um, you know, alligators if we couldn't sort of team together and build clans and other things like that. Yeah. So to survive, you have to manipulate, you have to mimic those emotions. And again, going back to Amy, I think she could have benefited from a serious dose of therapy. Oh, God. Um, And not from her two psychologist parents, because that's the thing, too. You kind of see this in families that I think share the same sort of, quote, noble professions of, say, law or medical Mm -hmm. stuff or psychiatry, psychology, uh, even like writers, things like that, is that you just kind of become numb to that whole trade after a while. Uh, There is a cynicism that sets in. And when when they're psychologists and they're dealing with the human mind and the emotions and all the things, it's almost like... They're manipulating. So I have a friend who's a psychiatrist and he also does uh, therapy. And he says, so he was having some challenges at home. And he said... This is an occupational hazard Mm -hmm. that you manipulate everyone in your family, that you raise your children through manipulation because you know the buttons to push. You know how to analyze them. And I feel like her parents kind of did that. And then she picked up the skill. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, in the sense that when you know, quote unquote, how the sausage is made, And that sausage involves manipulating human emotion because you're a student of the mind and you're living with two students of the mind. And this is part of Flynn's storytelling that is so brilliant here is the way she captured it. I read these characters and they both have very distinct voices, male and female. And you, although Amy's like she has this poised, very feminine a quality to her, but she's also very uh, crude in some ways, you know, very biting and unapologetic with her language, which I I, I love. Um, mm-hmm. and, but that tends to ha- come with a little bit of a masculine bent to it. But it's still, like, she built these two very unique characters, and you believe them. Like, they feel very well fleshed out. You can see them in their very distinct places, how they got from point A to point B psychologically, given their upbringings and just given their the fact that Nick was raised in Missouri and moved out to New York City to pursue a journalism career 
is something that I keenly relate to because that's something I very much wanted to do myself when I was in. Exactly. So did it. Uh, and we did it. And so <laughs> being that transplant into New York in this crazy world, I related to Nick a lot with that aspect. Whereas Amy, she was a Manhattanite socialite. And interesting, you know, like I totally relate to Amy. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I mean, I don't justify her extreme version of it, but I completely relate to it. So I tend to think, actually, and this may be an unpopular view, that Nick shows some psychopathic tendencies mm -hmm. himself. There's that line where uh, the lawyer says, like, you guys are really fucked up, more fucked up than anything I've ever seen, mm -hmm. and I specialize in fucked up situations. And... um and there's this point where Nick says, like, that he often doesn't say it out loud, but, like, even when he should not do it, he compartmentalizes to a disturbing degree mm -hmm. in that in the basement of his belly, there are bottles of rage, despair, and fear. But you've never guessed from looking at him because he's always smiling. And That's the kind of the beauty of this book is it in this story is it is a very violent ballet between two sides of the same coin essentially he's hot she's cold or you know whatever these two are bonded by a shared sort of lack of ability to like they just have a lack of depth like to a certain point mm -hmm. and the thing is too we see with amy so you know after it's revealed that she you know set him up and that she you know, ran away and she was going to frame him for her eventual murder. We see Amy on the run uh, because the world thinks she's dead. And so she had to cut her hair. She did the whole Harrison Ford and the fugitive bit, you know, changed her appearance. She'd put on a little weight. She had, you know, saved some money. So and bought a car like a really old beater, a Ford Festiva. If I remember correctly, that detail is very fresh because I just read that today um, in my little reread. But anyway, she's out there in the world, on the street. And all of a sudden, this brilliant, this sort of like a uh, maestro of, pers of of a woman who can dictate an entire, you know, symphony around her fake death is mm -hmm. suddenly forced to fend for herself with very little money and, and an inability to really fight for herself in any fundamental way. You think she didn't originally intend to come back? That wasn't a part oh, of the Oh, in the book, she was going to kill herself and then mm -hmm. let her body be found. And then he would definitely be framed for and her he, murder. And she said, underneath the bodies of all the other women yeah. who have gone through that. Exactly. And... Yeah. But she was very quickly disarmed and robbed of her money by two people that she looked so far down her nose at. These Ozark, yep. white trash, you know, redneck people. That's that, her words. Pretty nice people, by the way, for robbers. Well, exactly. You know, they went fishing <laughs> together. They went out on the river boats together. I mean, they, they, you know, they hung out. They had a good time. And then they realized she was carrying about eight grand uh, in cash on her. And they wanted that money so she gets robbed and suddenly she's without nothing and she even admits to herself like i was never taught for instance how much things cost how to budget i was never taught how to fight i was never taught how to uh, deal with people like this and so all mm -hmm. of a sudden all the power that she has in this situation with nick um, and everybody else that she's manipulated and controlled over the years is t is completely gone. And suddenly she is like the rest of us. And, yes. and, and, I, and I think that is a really interesting thing, too, that even she was forced to change her plan. The mastermind of it all couldn't hack it out there in the world like the people that she always looked down on and i think there was like a mm. a, a deep humbling well not humbling because she she's as vicious as ever whenever she goes home uh <laughs> and i think though by the way those two robbers probably had a better relationship mm -hmm. better better coupled them than her and nick oh for sure you know and and there's this concept in the book that you know, that it's really difficult. Well, frankly, it's difficult to hold up manipulation in general, but it's kind of like conspiracies. They eventually fall apart. Right. But she makes that, there's this point in the book where you get the feeling that they both feel that it's really a difficult time to just 
be a person, like a real actual person. Mm -hmm. And that instead we play a collection of personality traits, like selected from fictional characters. And, you know, and the argument essentially is like, because we're all acting, there's no such thing as a soulmate because nobody's real. Yeah. And I, I understand where they're coming from. It's BS. I think on two levels. One, just be yourself, get to know yourself. And if the person doesn't like you, cool. And then the other piece of it is, and you'll relate to this because we've both seen this, the failure to deal with conflict has such enormous consequences. There's that scene where Amy is talking about having a baby and wanting to have a baby, mm -hmm. and Nick just wants to leave. Like, the failure to do deal with conflict, and, and people are so afraid of it for reasons I don't understand, is so costly. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> right? It's so unbelievably costly. Or something to be said, at least in your most intimate relationships, th that you need to be able to do it. I, I'll give you a great example. So one of my friends who doesn't struggle with conflict, we were in a group chat and I said something that she found offensive. Mm -hmm. And she dropped a voice note into the chat saying, hey, could you not do that because of blah, blah, blah. And then later she said to me, I really wish I hadn't done that in front of her, but I should have done it privately. And I was like, no, that's great because everybody needed that lesson. I completely screwed up there. I am sorry for it. And But I just think, what if she had held back? Right. And then I would have continued to make that same dumb mistake, I would have hurt her and that hurt would have remained in our relationship right. unresolved. And so I think some of this book is also about the cost of not dealing with conflict. No, oh, God. I mean, if Nick had, like when he discovered, was starting to discover things about Amy that he didn't like or her behavior that he didn't care for or whatever. And I think that's one thing that the book never... It's hard to make it uh, very clear because on the one hand, we can't believe it, really can't believe a damn word Amy says in the first half because yeah. she herself yeah. admits it was all a setup that all those diary entries were things she made up to frame him with. But mm -hmm. at the same time, by the time we get to the second half of the book, we don't really have a sense that of of the real Nick quite the maybe the thing that maybe reveals it a little bit about him is that like with the baby. Like, she didn't want mm -hmm. the baby. They were going to try to have a baby. And he actually really wanted it. But in the first half of the book, she depicts him as not wanting it. But it both show both of those scenarios, the false one and the true one, both reveal that they did not communicate properly about any of this at all. And they both came in with a certain set of expectations of one another that both started failing to live up to. And what did they do? They started being very avoidant. They started, you know, he starts leaving the house and staying gone all day and night between work. And, oh, what was it? He would go and sit in the garage of an abandoned house and read old magazines of articles that he wrote because he mm -hmm. was once a journalist and he Just got laid off. Just get away, right? Yeah, and it's like that kind of shit right there is... Uh, oh, and I love the way his sister calls him out for a guy loose job, has an affair with a 20-year-old. Yeah. It's very funny. Yeah. I think one of Nick's saving graces, actually, is that he's not an only child. Yeah. Because... I think only children have more um, pressure to not fail, mm -hmm. to not die, to not, you know, and I don't think uh, that's the case of all only children, but there's nobody to go screw up and buffer mm -hmm. the frustration and there's no one. And so I think Nick had an advantage um, on that end, but also his sister, was so wise, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, she she fed him the wisdom when when he really needed to hear it. The interesting part being that you know Nick is a very angry man. He he always kind of has been. He just carries a pit a pit of anger in him. But once he discovers that Amy is framing him Bitter and framing, yeah, him, yeah, and and the whole discovery of that, you could just feel like the homicide forming in this man's brain like mm -hmm. he's if if she's not dead now he's going to make sure she is if she if if she comes back and so yeah if he had found her in a dark alley yeah and 
And then he steps up the manipulation with the help of his attorney uh, to, you know, have that that interview um, but with the reporter. Because by this point, TV, you know, right. Amy's missing. She's sort of like the missing woman that's on Nancy Grace, you know, that everybody's mm-hmm. talking about. She's in some ways sort of the Scott. P- this is whole the Scott Peterson, Lacey Peterson thing almost, you know, and, and you could see you would mention like is. Is she, was she inspired by this? And I, I can't see how she wouldn't be, um, yeah. you know, because you can really feel that dynamic uh, in the media aspect of this story and the way that the cops are handling it and everything, too. So, But you were saying about that interview, the interview that he did? Yeah. So he wanted to do this interview. Thank you. Because he knew she was out there somewhere. So if he gets up and does this interview with this famous journalist who's sort of like a Diane Sawyer type, that this is going to go out in the airwaves, she'll see it and she'll come back and forgive him. But in his real secret heart, he wants her to come back so he can exact his revenge on her. her, Yeah. Yeah. And of course, a lot of things happen between that point because what after she's robbed she goes back to an ex who this rich guy that she dated for a long time and uh you know things happen there played brilliantly by neil patrick harris he was so good i really liked him uh although it's hard to watch him play like a you know bad guy bad guy yep. um but she does end up coming home after bad guy slash victim yeah after a lot of shit happens she seems to be like I have you now. We are, you know, finally together in this. I mean, it's just kind of like an awkward emotional clash, like when she comes home, because it's like the cops know she's full of shit, but they can't. There's not. What can they do? He knows. He wants to expose her in a book. She's writing a book. He's writing a book in secret about her that he wants to expose her. And she even puts a stop to that. And there's this element of when she comes back where I think people, including me, wonder, like, why did he let her back, Mm -hmm. right? Why not go on TV and tell the real story? Right. You know, you got the cops who know, your attorney who know, you got enough people who have a good idea. And so why did he take her back knowing how crazy she was? She was pregnant. Oh, yeah, yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think the pregnant piece is a part of him, but I think also a part of it was she was going to kill for this marriage. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people use those phrases, right? Right. They don't necessarily mean kill, but they do mean go to the extreme. Whether that involved killing herself, killing him, or killing the baby. You know what's interesting, too, is I think about why she's fighting so hard for this when... She doesn't need him, does she? I mean, why? No. Why does she need this marriage so badly? Vengeance. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> almost like she reminds me of someone, too, who is, like, hooked on something really bad, and she can't see that. Like, she's just, she thinks she's in control, but she's hooked every bit as much as, as he is by this dysfunction. But I wonder whether there's a grass is greener for both of them, right? Like, he thinks the grass is greener in the affair. She thinks the grass is greener in terms of running away and then gets robbed and the grass is not greener. Right. And uh, like, well, she went out there and saw the world thought it was found it scary, at least with Mm -hmm. Nick. uh, It's, it's the devil she knows and and, and can control. Yeah. And I think like, if you want to know the story of a lot of bad marriages, like (laughs) it, it really kind of fits that model where, and, and I actually think it can work out well if people um separate with each other but but i think the big difference between these two in most marriages i see with separation is they never knew each other right they never loved each other exactly right that first going back to that first line in the book where i sort of feel like nick it wouldn't have been that hard Mm -hmm. to know what was going on in amy's head i do think that there was a uh, willful and selective ignorance. Yeah. Uh, they were just both too hooked on the illusion of one another to settle for the reality of one another. So they they are going to do what it takes. And and what I find myself constantly going over in my head is how this ends. 
for them? How much longer does it go? (laughs) Well, and I also think like a part of it too, right? Like Amy wasn't really willing to do the real work with Nick. I don't know that it was laziness because the manipulation took a lot of energy, but Nick was just too lazy to do the hard work. Yes. He didn't want to do the hard work. And maybe, I mean, he detected that possibly it would be impossible. Like when you end up in relationships with somebody who has something like borderline personality disorder or antisocial or histrionic, any personality disorder in that cluster B of really emotional ones, not only is it hard work, it is hard, 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 hard work for both people. But I sort of feel felt like Nick wasn't willing to do hard work. And I always tell people, like, you are friends with somebody and infatuated with them, and it's lots of fun, and it's light. But once you start dating them or marrying marrying them, no, like 90% of your time is hard work for that 10% that's blissful. Oh, yeah. It is. I And I tell people when they start dating, I, I often say to them, well, get ready for the hard work. Yeah. Because that's what this is really about. I mean, when when I have found myself at the worst parts of of my now almost quarter century long marriage, uh, <laughs> certainly quarter century long relationship, uh, it has been Jesus, yeah, nineteen ninety nine. When when we have found ourselves at that lowest point, it usually comes after a series of years where we've just been on autopilot, and then all of a sudden mm. you just hit a wall. And then you got to like put the car back together again and maybe, you know, spiff it up a little bit, make a little more effort, and then we can coast again for a little while. And you know what? In many ways, like it's state, you know, there's a certain level of stability that I can count on from from that. But at least we're not plotting each other's active like demise um or harm you know in any way right you're not like <laughs> sabotaging each other's lives and killing when, your... but yeah get a divorce a... for god's sake i mean amy come on <laughs> get a divorce yes. girlfriend uh y- murder yeah. <laughs> is a lot requires a lot more energy also faking your murder probably requires even more well, the energy. work in those treasure hunts i mean man But it's a warning to everyone, right? Because she's not necessarily, you know, most people are not necessarily going to kill. But, like, look out when you uh, treat your spouse the way either of them Mm. treated each other. And one of the things, like, that I find find so interesting about both of them, as particularly as you go through the book, you realize, like... What we're dealing with in that book is an insane escalation of what they have been doing to everyone in their life. Like, even the guy that uh, Amy kills, she had manipulated him. Oh, yeah. She manipulated another guy to get rape charges against him when yep. he tried to leave her. Like, this is... And, and then sold the story to everyone as they had done harmful things to her. And for Nick, like, and you can see it particularly when he talks to his sister... He's always been a facade. Mm -hmm. Like being a facade is not new to him. And always picking the easy way out is not new to him. No. I mean, thank God his sister's in the book because at least there's somebody likable. I think she's the only one that gives him hope. And honestly, what's unfortunate is I feel that Margot will probably reach a tipping point herself and say, I'm getting the hell out of here because that girl had been through a lot herself. She lost jobs in the recession. She lost uh, businesses. And then she goes into business with her brother. And then all this happens. And she knows what's going on. You know, she knows what's up. Mm-hmm. And so how long is she going to put up with this shit? And she's the only stabilizing force that he has. I would say absent Margot, I think he is just, Nick is just, he's gone boy. I don't see a, a good, healthy outcome. And especially given that she's pregnant. Um, Because that's the thing, is that she inseminated herself because he had semen put away when they were going to originally try to have kids. And so she impregnates herself with that. And I don't see a healthy outcome for either one. Like, the man is having an affair with the red panties of his, you know, girlfriend who is his student in his office, yeah. like that is not going to turn out well. And anything Amy does is not going to turn out well. Running away, killing herself, starting a new relationship. Yeah. Like broken people. And 
you also get how broken people kind of gravitate as a broken person uh, toward each other. Um, and uh, like, again, that's about doing the hard work on yourself. But if you've never known yourself, mm-hmm. never known anything other than what other people painted and you tried to live up to, and I apply this to Nick because I really do view it like his life has been like hanging out with the Fight Club boys right. and hers was very much the parents. I think Nick and Amy take a very cynical view and that's the part that I find not inauthentic about the book because it is very authentic in the sense people do take that view, but I find it to be a less than accurate. It's an excuse. Yes. It's an excuse not to do the work. I, I think that's very good point. Uh, especially with the, the cynical view. I feel like a lot of people don't do that to the same extent they do. Like, I find myself sometimes when I'm watching a, a movie, like a very serious movie, um, mm-hmm. that I try to take those characters and imagine them pushing a cart through the grocery store. Or I try to imagine them in the line at the bank or somewhere really mundane and boring, mm. like the shit that you and I do every day, like that nobody yeah, needs yeah. to know about. You know, we're mm-hmm. just doing the 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 daily me scooping the cat litter, you know, just stuff like mm-hmm. and and it's like if I can't imagine these people in these scenarios without laughing, mm. then that tells me mm. that this story is elevated to a place that's uh in hyper reality. It's not quite yep. You know, and so that's one thing I like is that this story takes such a surreal, like exaggerated, like view. They are so real outside of the exaggerations. They come off so unbelievably. They do, but authentic. And they, and that's the thing. You take these characters that are very, uh, that feel very real, and you put them in this very hyper real situation, and suddenly you can use this to examine this big magnifying glass that she has given you to examine parts of your own life and your own relationships and go, Oh man, am I being as real as I need to be to make sure that I don't get maybe framed for my husband's murder one day, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, that he frames me for his own murder one day. Uh, (laughs) Maybe not that, but at least uh, maybe he won't uh, hate me or, you know, it doesn't play out as murder, but you know what it plays out as? Yeah. It plays out as like, the ex who posts all sorts of nasty things about you on Facebook. Yeah. It plays out as the person who undermines your mutual relationships. Mm-hmm. It's the person. Yeah. It's just like, it plays out. Like there's it a does. lesson for everybody. It does. And I just think there's that significant psychological cost to not aligning with your identity with your reputation, essentially. Right, right. Um, yeah, but I mean, both internally and both for the other people around you. And I think a big part of it is just letting go. Yeah. Like letting go of other people's expectations, letting go of all those voices in and your And neither of them can do that because on the one thing, Amy cannot allow herself to enjoy anything without pointing out how shitty it kind of is and she enjoys uh-huh. it anyway. That's literally her entire personality throughout the book is like... She's got that negativistic you know, bent. He, everything is so beneath her that it is like, mm-hmm. girl, can you just let it go and and enjoy some life without having to admit that it's below standard or not as you know it's this it's just like or it's just a fucking hot dog i mean the way she just describes right. like you know doing ordinary things cuz she's extraordinary that's how she she's so grandiose in everything that yep. she does whereas nick is sort of he's on a different part of that spectrum, but it's also very similar. Uh, And I think that's... They both think they're exceptional. Yeah. And his comes from probably a more nurture place and hers comes from maybe partially more of a nature place, but I don't know. I mean, it it can kind of go either way, but I want to bring it back to the fact that this book, I I love that we're still talking about it. It's 11 years old, just about. Um, Mm -hmm. Just had its 10-year anniversary in 2022, but also it's 12 years old. Christ, time is flying. Um, Flying by. But I love that this book, and as well as uh, Gillian's other books, I have to say, just 
as we're wrapping this up, if you have not read Sharp Objects or Dark Places, absolutely do that. Um, and especially um, check out the miniseries of Sharp Objects. Uh, it was on HBO a few years ago, Amy Adams um, and Patricia... Oh my goodness, I can't remember her last name all of a sudden. Beautiful blonde, uh old she's a little older, um, but she's been in a lot of things. Um, she's wonderful, but she's she plays Amy Adams' mother in it. Um, mm, and it is yes, one of the yes. most beautifully shot, beautifully adapted books. I I would yes. probably say I've seen hundred percent. I think the small things that are different do not change the thrust of it. Mm -hmm. And I think, to your point, as we're wrapping up, like, you know, I think my message to people contemplating a relationship, starting a relationship, in a relationship, might be a little too late to, uh, like, I, I mean, you should change it. But just do you mm -hmm. and let the person fall in love with the real you or not fall in love with you. Like, drop you may keep your facades for other parts of life, but in your deepest, most intimate relationship, do you or pay the price yeah. for not doing you? Yeah, that is I, I couldn't put it any better than that, because I really do feel like if either one of them had been honest with each other from the very beginning, they never never would have progressed beyond that first night. Correct. Or if it did, you know what you were getting into. Yeah. And I don't know why anyone would do that. And in order for you to do you, you have to like you. So, yep. you know, we got to work on those things too. And, and you know, so many of these stories kind of, you can really distill them down to a lot of that. Like these people really need to get their shit figured out. My God. <laughs> Over time, you have to learn to to love the things that you hate about yourself mm -hmm. because they are a deep and rich part of you um, that are relatable to so many other people. But I think in loving those things, you can begin to learn what you've gotten out of them and see yourself realistically and then love yourself realistically. So I think that's another element. If you compartmentalize the things you don't like about yourself, you're in trouble. And if you think that you need to like everything about yourself to love yourself, mm -hmm. you're also nuts. So, <laughs> I, so to your point, I think that there's, I mean, that's why we grow. That's why we change as humans. Right. But to your point, I do think that you know, the fundamental flaw of these two people was not really loving themselves mm -hmm. or to some extent not even allowing themselves to fully form. Yeah. And if you are in an environment uh, where you have the opportunity to raise or shape the minds of young people, um, be be careful, be be mind yeah. be mindful of the adults you're creating. Because yeah. I think that too few people don't do that. And you see these products of horrible upbringings and having to wonder at which generation will the trauma stop or, you know, the yeah. abuse, well, who's going to stop the cycles. And so when I'm thinking of when I'm writing stories about messed up families and messed up marriages, because now that's pretty much where my brain lives, where in terms of my fiction is concerned, you know, most of the projects that I'm developing in terms of fiction are revolving around that. It, and it is thinking constantly about who was the person that, you know, grew into what we're seeing here, where let's let's whittle it down and go all the way back. And And usually I find my brain going, okay, what did this person's mother or father or family member or, you know, teacher or somebody that had influence over them, hurt them. <laughs> we know now, you know, I think Margaret Yellow, what is it? Yellow Horse, um, a social worker out in New Mexico or not social worker, but a professor mm -hmm. of social work. You know, we know that uh, from indigenous people, intergenerational trauma mm -hmm takes like seven generations to address. And more recently, researchers have noted that trauma changes your DNA that you pass yeah. down. Yeah. And so I think there's a cost for generation to generation. And I think if 
you know, my message to parents would be, let your children be who they are because unconditional love is to allow them to be who they are. It doesn't mean you have to accept every behavior. Right. But it does mean that you can love what you have. And I think so many people do not have the capacity, in part because their parents Mm -hmm. didn't love them unconditionally. I tell people that a lot in terms of, you know, at least trying to understand their own trauma and the people that hurt them Mm -hmm. and going, okay, now who hurt them? And then we can go back and go, okay, who hurt that person? Because it is. And then you can find compassion. Yeah, at least a little bit of that for your own sanity. So Yeah. um, And again, you don't have to accept the behaviors, but you can still find compassion. Yeah. And it's very powerful if you can keep boundaries and also have compassion for the people who hurt you. You know, at the in the tie back into this book, we can say, you know, we could we could debate or go back and forth about who's the worst person or who whatever, um, who did the worst things or who's the most unsalvageable or whatnot, but Interestingly, I have a lot of compassion and empathy for them both for very yes, different, absolutely. very different reasons. Mm-hmm. And I think that speaks to the power of what Flynn wrote because it's hard to do this. And so, yeah. you know, to to make these characters that are both unlikable but sympathetic at the same time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've tried to do that myself and it's very difficult. And I mm-hmm. will never attain the mastery that she has. <laughs> and I have all the love oh, and respect. I just like, <laughs> I've never met her. And I, even though we have a very common associate, it's like uh, mm-hmm. between the two of us, uh, I haven't been able to engineer some way that we can all get together for <laughs> lunch or something in Manhattan. But, um, you know, a girl can dream. And it also does make me wonder what from Gillian's life inspired this, but I may never want to know. Oh, you know, I mean, she is just a fascinating person in and of herself. And yeah, I would love to 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 sit down and pick her brain. And I and I will leave on one little bit here uh, of something that she wrote. And I'll post this in the show notes. But she wrote this when Sharp Objects came out. And it was an essay entitled, I Was Not a Nice Little Girl. I'm just going to read in a little excerpt from it. And then uh, the rest of it, I, I encourage you guys to um, check out. We devour the news about Susan Smith or Andrea Yates, women who drown their children. But we demand these stories be rendered palatable. We want somber asides on postpartum depression or a story about the man who made her do it. But there is an ignored resonance. I think women like to read about murderous mothers and lost little girls because it's our only mainstream outlet to even begin discussing female violence on a personal level. Female violence is a specific brand of ferocity. It's invasive. A girl fight is all teeth and hair, spit and nails, a much more fearsome thing to watch than two dudes clobbering each other. And the mental violence is positively gory. Women entwine. Some of the most disturbing, sick relationships I've witnessed are between longtime friends and especially mothers and daughters. Innuendo, backspin, false encouragement, punishing withdrawal, sexual jealousy, garden variety jealousy. Watching women go to work on each other is a horrific bit of pageantry that can stretch on for years. And I blame men. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and that's the thing is that that there's a lot of misogyny that results in a lot of this kind of behavior that but we're also expected to button up and be proper and and quote unquote nice ladies or ladylike. But there is that ferocity. There is that violence. There is that that sort of rancor that um is not expressed in the feminine way and in the feminine sense. And I think that she gave so many women power to talk about these things and not feel ashamed of them. It's almost like that ability yeah. to examine your cellulite on your thighs and just show it to the world like, yeah, guys, this is my flesh. This is what it looks Actually, like. This is who you know? I really am. Yeah. Yeah. There's this uh, Carl Jung the psychologist has this theory about our shadow. Mm. And it's, you know, a bit of our dark side. It's a bit of who we were as a child. And that if his theory essentially is if we don't embrace that shadow, 
the shadow will still follow us around and sneak up on us. And I think so many women are not allowed to embrace their shadow the way that men are. Yeah. So when it comes out, it comes out like a volcano. Yeah. And so this comes back to one of my favorite topics, like gender equality, man. Yeah. Like, we got a long way to go. <laughs> and, you know, we can we can just realize that as human beings, regardless of gender or biological sex, is that we are we are capable of great things and capable of horrible things. Some and, seriously crazy and things. And we're going to be talking about so much of that stuff, uh, you and I together on the journey uh, of wherever we go. And yeah. uh, you're just awesome. Uh, oh, yeah. thank you, Allison. I feel the same way about <laughs> you, my friend. Uh, it is great to have you as a friend, as a colleague, as a... Uh, you know, partner in crime occasionally on some things. Partner in true crime. <laughs> yes. 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 In true crime. <laughs> yes. In the true crime community. Oh my gosh. Yeah. The true crime community is, is really something. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's, it's nice to have friends to weather it with. Um, right. Because, Absolutely. You know, I mean, the, who, who's going to be the next gone girl? Uh, right. You know, you just never know. Um, but honestly, if you are a true crime fan, uh, reading this book through the lens of true crime and understanding it is, um, it's beautiful. It, it really is. I mean, I was just saying, I'm I'm seeing like all these different murder cases uh, mm -hmm. through the talk of mm -hmm. like hearing these lawyers and police talk. And then I just want to like go, oh, I wonder what Brett would think about what that lawyer just said. What about Bob Mata? <laughs> thinks about, what, Bob, how does Bob Mata mm -hmm. feel about Tanner Bolt? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. So, um, I like, can tell you how I feel. That man is bad. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Played by Tyler Perry, by the way, in the movie. Yeah. He mm -hmm. he was that mm -hmm. was a great choice in, in great casting. Job. Um, but I'm going to leave it off here and, you know, the show is back essentially. This is the first show of the new year and I'm going to keep pumping out the episodes. Got a big project underway that I'm not ready to reveal yet, but Jason knows what it is. And a few mm -hmm. other people know what it is. Excited. Um, and yeah, and if the very few of you out there that know that are listening right now, you're probably, you know, well, you're like, get on with it already. Make it happen. But mm -hmm. something big is coming and you're going to hear about it very soon. And I hope that, you know, you stick along for the ride because it's going to be it's going to be pretty, pretty amazing. But um, in the meantime, I want you to head over to Apple, leave the show a review. If you like it, a five star review would be amazing. Uh, head over to the Facebook page to leave comments or suggestions on episodes you'd like to hear about. Uh, I'm looking to do a bunch of short ding dong ditch episodes here in the coming weeks as, uh, you know, I got a lot of little ideas go percolating in my brain. So um, I got a bunch of that coming. And yeah, the big announcement the big announcement. We're just going to leave you in suspense on that. But uh, in the meantime, thank you for listening and we'll see you next time. This episode was produced by yours truly, Allison Nixon, and wouldn't be possible without the amazing contributions of countless friends, family, and supporters. Big shouts also go out to Nathaniel Dixon for all the show art, as well as Spencer Morlock and Ken Dixon for the music. I'll be back with something new next week. In the meantime, you know what to do. Be good, you little ding-dongs. Thanks for joining us for this Silver Linings Handbook podcast bonus episode. We'll see you all again in a few days. If you'd like to join us for more discussions with us and our listeners, we can be found on most social media platforms, including a listeners-run Facebook group called the Silver Linings Fireside Chat. For deeper conversations with our guests and live conversations with other listeners, you can also join us on our Patreon at www.patre on.com forward slash the silver linings handbook.